welcome you to worship on this Christmas Eve. We're at that place on this long journey where we're nearing the end. We're on the precipice of the destination. I found on journeys like that, it's in that place where I'm both exhausted from the long journey that's behind, but also filled with hopeful anticipation of the destination that is ahead. So as we dwell in that place where we're in between what has been and what is not yet, let it be a place where we are renewed by spirit and we are encouraged by the hope that is ahead of us, even if we find ourselves weary from what we have journeyed through behind. Let this night of service be a time of transformation for us as we gather in worship with those songs and words that are so familiar to us in this Christmas season as we pray. Join me as we pray together. O Jesus, our Lord and Savior, light of the world, we prepare our lives this night for your arrival. We prepare remembering that you understand what it is to feel left alone in the midst of great suffering. We remember, O God, that you remain with us even as we continue to endure in difficulties such as these. Awaken our hearts as we bear witness to the sickness, the sacrifice, even death amidst, in our midst. In these dark months that we have journeyed through so long, we've asked, How long, O Lord? But help us now as we watch and pray and wait with signs of hope on the horizon. Gracious God, fill us once again that when we long for a world returned to normal, inspire us toward a, a world transformed by your love. When we feel forgotten and lonely, God, help us to find solidarity through your love. When we cannot yet see your face, help us to see you in the faces of others, especially, God, those that we journey with in this Advent season. As we near the journey's end, let us encourage and strengthen one another as we love you and love one another as you have loved us. When we feel only sorrow in our souls, help us, God, to know that the joy of the gospel promise is about to be fulfilled, that Emmanuel, God, you are with us. When we feel only grief in our hearts, help us to find consolation in the knowing that you are with each and every one of us. And when we walk through times of darkness, give us faith that we are headed toward brighter days in the light of your presence. Give us the light that will illumine our eyes and that will show us the light in one another. Even in this winter, when the ground appears barren and the warmth of your love and grace among us, restore your creation. Plant seeds of those hopeful words in us this Christmas Eve that we might be prepared once again to shout from the rooftops and from the hilltops the good word that God is with us, that born unto us this night in the city of David is a Savior, Christ the Lord. For it is in Jesus, your name we pray. Amen.
A reading from Isaiah 11. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But the righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hands on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice! Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou root of Jesse's tree, an ensign of thy people be before thee. Peoples in 
In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will only be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who has said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with the child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us.
In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house of and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Advent hope moves us. Advent love leads us. Advent joy stirs us. Advent peace stills us. That we might affirm our King Jesus. Today we light the Christ candle. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judea. He was the long-awaited Messiah whose coming was prophesied. The same Jesus lives today in our hearts. He deserves our highest loyalty and total commitment. In Jesus Christ, our hope is fulfilled, our love is consummated, our joy is complete, and our peace is sealed. Rejoice, a Savior is born. A Savior is born, indeed, joy to the world. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. 
Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. My friend and colleague in ministry, Pastor Lana J. Robin, recently began serving as a missionary in the Tangayiki Conference of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Lana and I, we attended seminary together at Christian Theological Seminary, students in Indianapolis, and we've been fellow Illinois Great Rivers Conference pastors together in ministry for 25 years. It's fascinating to me that when many of the clergy colleagues that we graduated with, including this pastor settled into a pretty steady ministry, honed into familiar and rather comfortable patterns of conduct, moving through the cycles of the Christian year with ninja-like stealth and fluidity, Lana decided to chuck it all and head out into the middle of the Congo in the name of Jesus. Hmm, that is something. Talk about humbling yourself to follow where Jesus would lead. She's only had her feet in the red clay soil of the Congo now for about three weeks as she plows headlong into Christmas with the rest of us. And listen to what she wrote a couple of days ago in a Facebook post. It's very interesting to me that Christmas is not such a big deal here. Well, many of the traditions anyway that I am missing that make it feel like Christmas aren't really important. There are no Christmas trees, wreaths, Advent candles or Christmas decorations in the churches that I have visited. Some even have no electricity for the lights or glass in the windows to keep out the rain. There are 
certainly no Santas or reindeer or snowmen. I mean, what's snow? How many of our Christmas songs and hymns talk about dark and cold and winter and snow? Many of the carols don't make sense in the Congo. The hymns and songs being sung here don't really have anything to do specifically with Christmas or Advent at all. Actually, Advent and all the themes of hope and joy, love and peace in any order are not even mentioned in any of the churches that I have been visiting these last three weeks. There is no scurry of last-minute Christmas shopping in town, no Christmas cookies, and definitely no candy baking. Lana seems to echo the musings of the Grinch's puzzled mind as he stood his feet cold in the snow looking down over Whoville. It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas perhaps means something a little bit more? Lana continued in her reflections, writing, What is shared in common is the truly amazing faith in Emmanuel, God with us in Jesus. The message of Christmas Emmanuel, God with us, is God breaking in among the weak and the vulnerable and like them, sharing then in their suffering. And this is precisely the message that I think we often miss at Christmas. God does not come to the part of us that swaggers through life confident in our self-sufficiency. God does not condescend to the confines of humanity in glory with glamour and grace. Instead, the incarnation breaks in, breaks in through messy, complicated, dirty, smelly, complex, albeit compelling disorder into the arms of a fearful teenager surrounded by beasts of burden in an otherwise forgettable setting. God leaves the treasure of our Lord and his love in the broken, fragmented places of our life. God comes to us in those rare moments when we are able, whether by choice or compelled by condition, to transcend our own selfishness just long enough to really care about something that is more than ourselves. And are we not now in such circumstances? We're compelled by the conditions of this pandemic, to put others ahead of ourselves, to be stripped of the familiar in order to protect those who may be unknown, to sacrifice what has for so long seemed sacred in our silent nights of Christmas for the prospects of a Noel to be sung again someday by voices unknown now to us. You see, I have been learning, or rather, I have been reminded amid this pandemic practice that Advent, this Christmas, it's not about packages, boxes, or bags. It's not about Advent wreaths or candles or carols or churches, let alone snow or Santa. It's about the incarnation. Tim Keller writes of it this way. He says, Christmas is frankly doctrinal. That's a a churchy way of saying Christmas is a belief. And what we believe about Christmas is that the invisible has become visible, that God became human, that the Almighty has humbled himself as a servant and lived among us. This is not a specific belief that is, uh, that is something uh, known among anybody else. It is unique. Doctrine, Keller writes, always distinguishes you. One of the reasons that we, he says, are afraid to talk about our doctrines is because we are afraid that it distinguishes us from others. So here's why the doctrine of Christmas is unique. On the one hand, when we have some religions that say that God is imminent, that that is, he's existing and operating in all things, that incarnation is normal. In other words, if you're a, a Buddhist or a Hindu, God is imminent in everything while not in any one thing. But on the other hand, religions like Islam and Judaism say that God is transcendent, that is beyond, unable to be contained by anything and all over things, and then therefore incarnation is impossible. But Christianity, Christmas, is unique. 
It doesn't say that incarnation is normal, but it doesn't say that it's also impossible. It says that God is eminent, that God that is desires so deeply to be so close to us that it is possible, but he also transcends this incarnation, that God has become human, and this, this humanity is equally God and human at the same time, and this is a history-altering, life-transforming, paradigm-shattering, event-changing life. The eternal God dwells with us and for us and among us. That's why I said Christmas is, at least in part, about getting beyond ourselves, about selflessness. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but instead Jesus emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself. Or if you're not familiar with the Apostle Paul, what about then Fred, Ebenezer Scrooge's nephew in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol? There are many things for which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, Christmas among the best. But I am sure that I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come around, apart from the veneration due to the sacred name of origin. If anything belonging to it can be apart from that. I see it as a good time, as a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time that I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts and think of people below them as if they were fellow passengers to the grave and no other not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, therefore, it has never put a scrap of, of gold or silver in my pocket. I believe that it has done me good, and it will do me good, and therefore I say, God bless it. And God does bless it. Not only that, but God has ordained it. God has given to us Christmas by giving us the first gift of Christmas. And no, it's not a bell off the reindeer's harness. God has given himself to us. Emmanuel, God with us, love, come down at Christmas. So look again. Look again at the profound story. For it isn't, isn't that what Christmas is all about? To tell the story again, to enliven the profound pronouncement of the indescribable truth that God is with us, is not the tinsel and the trappings of our story this, that it is the genesis of the most transformational truth that is told in all of human history. And so we go to the Gospels. Go to the the Gospel of Mark, for example, the oldest Gospel, the Gospel that Luke and Matthew probably had on their table as they wrote their own accounts of this transformational truth. And and he says it this way. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Oh boy, here we go. It's going to get good. And it is written in the prophet, by the prophet Isaiah. Yes! The mighty prophet Isaiah. The one who told us what was going to happen. The prophet. This is getting good. Are you ready? Here it comes. See... I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. For John the baptizer appeared. Wait, what? John the Baptist? He's not supposed to be here. It's too soon. Where's Mary? Where's Joseph? Where's where's the stable and the manger? Where are the angels and the shepherds and the sheep and the star and the wise men and the gifts? This is not the Christmas that I know. This is not my Christmas story. This is not the way that we celebrate Christmas. Something is missing. How will we prepare? How will our pageants be performed? What roles will the children play if there are no sheep or angels or stars? But John the baptizer says that he came to prepare the way proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, saying, I prepare you with external things, water, or maybe in our interpretation, advent wreaths, carols, candles, trees, lights, 
snow. But the one who is to come, he will prepare you with internal things through the inward transformation by the Holy Spirit. We're not gathered in this space tonight, I know. You're gathered instead in your homes. But we are gathered around the amazing faith in Emmanuel, God with us. It's not about preparing with external things, but it is about opening ourselves inwardly for transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are tonight invited to humble ourselves, prepare inwardly to hear and to receive the good news again that God is with us. And knowing that God isn't uh, about making life spiffy and, and simple for us, but that God is about bringing the perfect presence of the kingdom, living closer to the imperfect realities of our backwards ways of understanding and the brokenness that we try so desperately in our lives to hide. Christmas is upon us. So let us once again prepare to receive it. And as Jesus did, let us prepare by humbling ourselves, opening our shut up hearts freely, thinking of one another as fellow passengers on the journey of life and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys, not as people who are so different, but instead who come and gather around the common promise that God who is so absolutely uncommon, has loved us so much that he has become us in the broken realities of this chaotic and convoluted Christmas. Let us prepare to receive Christmas by being ready to receive that gift. And may God bless us, everyone. Amen. Join me as we pray. Gracious and eternal God, we do on this night gather and celebrate around the story that you loved us so much that you have come down at Christmas to be with us, to be us, to be like us, to be humbled as a servant, God, to live a life that would give to us life in the full And that you came, God, to demonstrate what it it is to bear one another in the burdens of life and to bear with one another that we might share those burdens and thereby make the burden light. For you said, come to you, Jesus, when we are weary and burdened and there we'll find rest for your yoke is easy, your burden is light. So lighten the load this night on Christmas for us that we might sing the joy of Christmas in our hearts that we might open our hearts once again to the beauty of that good word, the gospel message, the promise of your love, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you for being with us this night, Lord, and go with us in all that is ahead in the new days, ahead in the new year that awaits, that we may love you and share your love with others. For it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. On this night, one of those traditions that helps us to remember is one that we will continue to celebrate tonight in a new way. Jesus said that you and I, we are the light of the world. But it's not because our own light shines, but it is because, as John said, Jesus is the light of the world. And he came for those who sit in darkness, for we have seen a great light. So let us share the great light of Christ that is shining brightly in the world. Hopefully you have candles like this one in your home right now. And if you do, I invite you to to light those candles and to prepare to let your little light shine as we share in song the words of that beautiful hymn that reminds us of this Christmas and every Christmas past and gives us hope for every Christmas to come. Silent night. Join me as we sing.
Son of God, love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face, with the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. We sing of that tonight, but more than that, we live that in our lives. Son of God, born in us, let those beams of his radiant light shine brightly upon you this night, that we then might shine brightly those beams in the world that is before us. Merry Christmas to you. God bless you. And may the peace of our Lord be with you always. Amen.